Julie, you want to do a quick Zoom overview and then I'll I'll kick it up out. Sure. Off. Good morning, everyone. Um, while we have the program going on, we do want you to participate and uh, be engaged. So if you have a question during the presentation, you should see a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, or it may be at the top. And sometimes you kind of have to hover your mouse around your screen just to get it to pop back up. If you click that Q&A, you'll have the option to type a question, and then we can make sure that that gets answered for you. We also have the chat option. We're going to be posting some links and references in that chat area, but if you have any comments that you want to include, feel free to include those in the chat. Um, and then occasionally we may ask you a question where you can raise your hand like if you were on beforehand and we practiced with that. Uh, we might be asking you to raise your hand and you should see that raise hand icon as well on your screen. So with that being said, Dave, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Julie. Um, are you seeing the PowerPoint with the sycamore bark on it? Great. So I'm Dave Apsley. I'm a natural resource specialist with Ohio State University Extension, and I'm going to let Jim introduce himself. I'm uh, Jim Downs. I'm an assistant professor of forestry here at Hawking College. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for joining us. Um, well, today we're going to talk about winter tree ID. If you're new to our Day in the Woods series, um, the Day in the Woods typically is from May through November. Um, and typically during non-COVID times, it is somewhere in Southeast Ohio, oftentimes at the Vinton Furnace State Forest. And the uh, webpage that I just posted, u.osu.edu slash Southeast Ohio Woods, SE Ohio Woods, is where you'll find all of our schedules and programming um, that we do. Um, and we do a variety of topics. Um, this is our last program for 2020. We're looking at doing some winter programming starting back up in January, but we have not set a schedule for 2021 yet. So stay tuned and keep an eye on that web page. Um, that'd be a good question um, as far as Q&A, or I'm sorry, just your reaction. Hands up if you've been to a Day in the Woods program, virtual or live. So we've got a lot of repeat customers. That's awesome. And it's still climbing. Cool. All right. Thank you. So winter tree ID. Um, we've got lots of partners with Day in the Woods. Jim Downs, who's already introduced himself, is going to help out today. He's from Hawking College. But normally we do these live and we go to the woods with probably five or six instructors. Um, unfortunately, with COVID, it's a lot tougher. We're going to do our best to use the technology. Um, we're going to start out with a little PowerPoint and talk a bit about, you know, just some of the things to look for in the winter. And then we're, we've got a series of very, very short videos that um, provide you with just a look at the tree and the bark. And then we'll discuss what we look at when we look at those videos. If we've got time later, um, I might show you one of our short tree ID videos and I'm gonna go ahead and type in the web link for that. So give me just a second. If you go to that link, there are about 33 to five minute videos and we'll feature a tree and discuss how we identify it and what we're looking for. So that's a, a, a nice new resource for you. And we launch a new one every week uh, on Tremendous Tuesdays, Tremendous Tuesdays. So to kick things off, with tree identification for new folks new to tree ID, we really recommend starting with leaves if you can, but obviously leaves are pretty hard to find right now for most species. Some are still hanging on. Of course, our conifers are still hanging on to some needles. Most of them are at least. I noticed my bald cypress still have a few left and my larch still have a few left. But for the most part, our deciduous trees start to lose leaves, you know, a few weeks ago, the big winds and the heavy rains we've had in the past few weeks have pretty well wiped out most of our foliage. So when we do a summer tree ID class, this is the last slide that we usually present. So we talk a lot about leaves in the summer. In the winter, we have to focus on what we can find. So bark is something that we'll focus on a bit today. Buds, which are probably new to a lot of you, most people don't think about buds. 
and leaf scars. And we'll identify or we'll define all these terms as we go. Pith, which is the center of the twig, and we'll show you some examples of pith. Fruit and flowers can be good. Um, very few species have soft fruits. Um, I noticed the persimmons are still hanging on, but at this time of year, we're usually talking about hard fruits like nuts that are still available that you might be able to find on the ground or still on the tree. Flowers, um, anybody out there think of a species that might have flowers this time of year? Jim's smiling, he knows. Well, only one thing I can think of, can you think of anything other than the one, Jim? Um, I think mistletoe. Mistletoe has mine. flowers this time of year, and that's woody, I believe. Yep. And somebody put witch hazel in the chat box, so good. So witch hazel is a fall, late fall, winter flowering. I've seen them flower with snow on, so that's a cool, but it's really a shrub. Thorns, the tree form and shape can work. Um, it, it's just one of those things that's hard to learn. And then finally, where you're located, you know, are you down in a swamp? Are you up on a dry ridge? That all matters. And all these things are, you know, not easy to pick up, but over time, if you keep looking at identify with the characteristics that you are familiar with and then look at the tree as a whole, your, your mind will start to associate those things. So it takes time, it takes practice, but we can get there. So bark, who can tell me what bark is? Any ideas what bark is? If you got any ideas in the chat window as far as what's bark, what's its purpose? Somebody wanna stick that in the chat window? If we go back a little bit to uh, tree physiology, bark does provide that protection. But if you think about how a tree grows, it doesn't grow from the very outside edge like we might think. It will grow from the tip of a twig and at the roots, but they'll also grow radially. And we've got this layer called the cambium, which is where the phloem and the xylem are produced. So inside that cambium layer is where the woods produce. And outside is where the phloem, which carries the food reserves up and down in the tree. And then beyond that, it gets more complicated with things like cork cambium and some other terms we probably can't get into today. But if you think about that tree, it's actually growing from under the bark. So it's not growing on the outside layer. So as it grows and produces more wood, the bark on the outside splits and that's what gives it that characteristic. Some trees can produce new, new bark or fill those splits and they do it differently. But essentially the tree is outgrowing its outer shell. And I always like to use the analogy of the Incredible Hulk, kind of outgrow the clothes and you split. And that's kind of what's going on with bark. So while we're showing some bark pictures, anybody know what that one is? You can stick it in the chat window. We can make try to make it a little more interactive. Shag bark, good. So yes, bark is mostly dead cells and that is shag bark hickory. Um, although from the photo, could you be sure of that shag bark, Jim? Or would you have another potential one that might be? Yeah, so if it was growing in a, a lower area, I might be inclined to think that it might be a king nut hickory or a shell bark hickory. Yep. So shag bark hickory is typically a little bit more upland and the shell bark typically grows down on floodplains almost and the shell bark or king nut is usually a big tree when they you know when they get um, some time to grow they can be very tall and very large diameters and they'll actually produce a bigger um, hickory knot than the shag bark but they look very much alike you got to get in the buds and leaflet numbers to really separate the two but a lot of folks don't realize there is a shag bark and there's a shell bark and they are two different species another name for shell bark is king nut Hickory. We got bark that gets kind of blocky like this. Any guesses on left versus right in the chat window? So I won't delay it too much. The one on the left is actually persimmon. Gets really blocky, deep furrowed. The one on the right is black gum. And they look pretty similar, but you'll see some su subtle color differences and probably just not as deep of fissures between these bark plates. And then someone put dogwood in, which is what this one is. So it looks very, very similar. Um, but again, uh, tree size will play a role in that a lot of times too. 
that's not a great photo. We'll we'll show you some more photos later, but that's actually black cherry bark. You, probably the most common descriptor. What do, what do your students use, Jim, for the descriptor? I, I always describe bark? it as it looks like burnt cornflakes glued all burnt, over the tree. Burnt cornflakes or burnt potato chips is what folks, but so they're little rounded plates. And then we've got other bark like this. Um, that's obvious to most people. That's probably American beech, but there are a few species with very smooth bark like that at different stages. Um, especially red maple, if it's if it's a young tree, and I've seen them pretty large that have very very similar looking bark. Um, so essentially, American beech does not keep as many layers of bark, and it actually. I think the cork cambium is kicking in and it, it just has a totally little different process of how it produces bark. Um, what makes this hard to identify in this picture is it doesn't have any carvings in it. I think 90% of American beach of any size have carvings in it. Here's another one, just um, tough to do the bark pictures. And again, I got some videos on this, so I'm not gonna spend a ton of time, but that's white ash. How about this zebra looking bark? Not one many of us see very often. And again, bark is tough because it varies by age, by growth rate of the trees. It looks different in different regions. Um, but these broad, light colored strips, they're flattened ridges. Um, it's a cousin of our black walnut. It's butternut and not one we see out in the woods very often anymore because of a fungal uh, canker disease. Butternut is also called white walnut. How about this one? So if you're if you're kind of noticing a pattern, what we typically do with tree ID is we we're forcing you to look at details. A lot of people kind of stand back and look at a tree and say, oh, I don't know what it is. But if you really start looking at details, you're going to see um, things that you may not have seen in the past. And that's all we're trying to do today is point out some of the things to look for. This is hackberry, and I see a few of you are putting that in there. Eugene and Aaron got it right. Um, hackberry, when it's small, can have fairly smooth gray bark. It might be a little bumpy, but as it gets older, it has this very unique bark pattern where scattered on the surface, you'll see these layers of bark, and it's a very attractive, neat bark. And that's hackberry. And then there's other clues. I have to throw my one conifer in, but there are a few conifers that will actually sprout little leaves or needles on the main trunk. And that can be a good ID characteristic for some of our conifers. This is pitch pine, a native to Southern Ohio. Shortleaf pine can do this as well. So any, while we're there, any questions on bark? And again, I've got about, I don't know, at least 20 very short videos that what I've done is uh, looked at the tree from a little distance where we'll look at bark and we'll look up in the crown and Jim and I will describe what we look for. And then we've got another one where we're zoomed in a little bit more. So we're gonna do that a little bit later in the, in the presentation. But at this point, any questions? Okay. So another thing to look for is fruit. There are some fruits that do hang around on some of our trees into the winter. Uh, a good example is um, this one on the left. Anybody know what that one is? Let's see if anybody can find that one. I'm gonna, I lost my, I've been playing around here. I lost my pictures of my co-host here. Yeah, it is American sycamore. Those fruits are really tight. There are these dozens and dozens of these little wing fruits that are all packed in that um, fruit. It's got a really long stalk and they're really hard packed and they'll hang on all winter. They'll get beat up in the wind, but usually they'll hang on. And then in the spring, when the humidity's drop down, um, those seeds with their little wings look like little paratroopers and they'll just start dispersing and blow in the wind. What about the one on the lower right? I see American beach popping up as the most common answer, and that is it. It's got this little burr looking fruit. Um, and then inside, you're going to find some little triangular looking nutlets, which is 
really unique uh, fruit. And those are great for wildlife and they seem to be pretty consistent um, producers. Jim, you want to talk about the Buckeyes for me? Yeah, sure. So um, we have a couple uh, different types of Buckeyes that we will commonly see here in Ohio. And really the one of the easiest ways to tell the difference between the Buckeyes um, is actually looking at the, the outer husk of the fruit. Um, and so the outer husk of the fruit on the yellow Buckeye will actually be smooth. It won't have any of these little spine or thorn-like features. Um, whereas down here in the example here with Ohio Buckeye, if you look closely, um, you'll see that you have like these little thorn like prickles uh, or small little spines on there. Um, so that's really the kind of the easiest way to tell the difference between the two Buckeyes. And the one thing that I always tell my students is that you don't really want to confuse these with the uh, chocolate and peanut buttery uh, Buckeyes <laughs> that you can buy from the store. Um, these will make you sick if you eat these. Yeah. And typically, the, these are, this may be a hybrid or something going on, but typically the Ohio Buckeye tends to be a little darker colored and more ebony, and the, and the yellow Buckeye has more of a reddish tint to it. Um, I did hear that it's really bad luck to wear Buckeye necklaces if they're not truly Ohio Buckeyes, too. So that's another warning that you got to make sure you I can identify these. So make sure the Buckeyes you're picking up have bumpy or warty husk versus the smooth husk. If you're in the northern part of the state, you're probably good. If you're in the south, um, you might uh, end up picking up some yellow buckeyes. This one's unique. Any clues what this is? It's a bean-like little fruit, which tells you it's a legume relative. So similar to the beans. I see red bud, locust. That fruit looks almost identical to black locust fruit. Very similar. But the clues on this one are the bark one, and to the location of where that fruit is produced. If you pay attention to red bud when it flowers in the spring, it's not uncommon to have buds, those red flower buds all along the main stem and on relatively large branches. Um, with most other trees, the flowers are up on the very tips of the branches or maybe back on the wood that was one year old, but rarely on the main trunk of a tree. So that's a good ID characteristic is where this fruit is produced. And if you start looking at red buds now, you're going to see these preformed little flower buds that are kind of swollen and they'll have a little bit of a reddish or purplish tint. So that's eastern red bud. But again, if it's a legume of fruit that has a husk that splits down the, into two sections, um, that narrows it down to a legume and that narrows it down to a fairly short list of trees. If you start looking at the size of that fruit, then you can narrow it down even further. If it's a big, long, similar looking fruit, it's probably honey locust. So there's, you know, you just got to really pay attention to what you can see this time of year. Then we've got other fruits that have these more winged wind dispersed seeds. These cones are on yellow poplar or tulip tree and they're starting to disperse now, but if you look under the tree, they can kind of can kind of confuse you. It almost looks like a walnut hanging up there when you're looking at this from directly underneath. But these little wing seeds with a hook at the base, uh, you'll find those all over the ground um, under yellow poplar trees. And this is not a great picture of maples, but these are winged seeds that are in pairs typically, and how those pairs are connected can help you identify the species of maple that we're looking at. And again, well, you can got, find these. Go I've ahead. got a short story to tell about uh, yellow poplar. So a couple of years ago, I was doing some timber stand improvement work in my in my woods behind my house. And so I was removing some lower quality uh, yellow poplar in favor of some better quality yellow poplar. But so I uh, was using a chainsaw and dropped a yellow poplar tree and it was in the kind of late winter. And so when I dropped this tree, it it brushed up against a great number of other uh, yellow poplar trees. And it was like I was in a snow globe. There was just all these uh, oh, seeds wild. cascading down around me. And it was kind of a really cool experience. But then I was very tempted to cut down another tree just, just to see it again. <laughs> I resisted. Too. I've never seen that. That's pretty cool. But they are very prolific seeders. And these seeds will I hang around in the litter layer for a few years. Some will germinate the first year and some will germinate later but they're very prolific. They're putting seeds everywhere. So if they get enough light, they're gonna grow and grow like crazy. But again, the maples are gonna be in pairs. They're called wing samaras and they're gonna be connected. And if you take one off and toss them, they spin down like little helicopters. 
it's like a silver maple here. These are walnuts. You're probably not going to see very often. These are actually the butternut more. They look similar to our black walnut fruit, but much more elongated, more egg shaped. And these are still hanging on. I got a few. I collected um, some twigs this morning and there's a very few of these persimmons hanging on. Um, I've had a blast with a game camera right under my fruit producing uh, persimmon this year. I've got gray fox, coyotes, and tons of deer coming in to eat those things off the ground. And then this fruit, this is the quiz that everybody has to learn. Who can tell me what this one is? Let's see if we've still got some folks out there. We're not putting them to sleep yet. Sumac, you're close. It's a relative. Poison ivy. Good job, Aaron. So poison ivy, um, one of the best ID characteristics of poison ivy in the winter is white little fruits. They're not much bigger. Oh, they're a little bit bigger than a BB, but they'll be in little clusters like this, usually out towards the tip of the twig. Um, and they are poisonous, although birds eat them. I've sat in a tree stand a lot of times watching songbirds come in and eat these things. You also notice these light tan colored, what they call naked buds. So you're actually looking at the buds. You're actually looking at next leaves next year's leaves kind of folded up. But this is one you want to be very familiar with in the winter months. What's another good ID characteristic for poison ivy in the winter? And Denise Ellsworth learned it the hard way at 19. <laughs> Denise, we need to make you a co-host and put you on here, put you to work. Harry Vine, good. We actually have one of those short little videos on on identifying poison ivy. We also have one comparing poison ivy to box elder because they have very similar looking foliage. So those are two short videos that are available on the, on the website. And I'll have uh, Danny stick that in there again, if you would, Danny, it's go.osu.edu slash tree ID. Good, so that's one when we're talking tree ID, especially in winter that you need to be very familiar with in all of its forms. I might throw, throw this one in because it's one of my favorites. You rarely bump into it, but we do have a native euonymus, and it has probably the coolest common name ever. It's called Wahoo. Um, so when you see it, you got to yell out Wahoo really loud. Um, there are some non-natives that you'll see out there, um, more climbers and some other non-native burning bush, which... Jim, I might have you to come down and help me out because I didn't realize I had as many little burning bushes I do right now because they're glowing up there and everything else has lost its foliage. So, but there is some non-native burning bush out there as well. The big key, the native burning bush typically has a green twig with kind of white lines running along the length of the twig. And they don't tend to square off or have the wings that's on the, the non-native winged euonymus. There's also a winter creeper in the same a genus too. More fruits. Um, we have four native sumacs, Jim. I know three real common ones. Yeah. Um, the one on the left is called winged sumac. The one on the right is smooth sumac. There's another one that has a real hairy twig that's called staghorn sumac. And then the other one, much less common, is poison sumac. Poison sumac has white fruits, whitish fruits like poison ivy. It's pretty rare in Ohio. You've got to be in a swamp to find it. It's probably more common in the north. I know it's in the Buckeye Lake area and some swampy areas around Buckeye Lake, but it's not a very common one. But what do we see different about these two fruit clusters? They're both sumacs, both small clonal kind of shrubs. What do you see different? So at least one of the things that I look at on the two sumacs is, yeah, exactly as some of the folks are putting in the into the chat, um, the smooth sumac has this seed that are going to be pointing upwards, so they're going to be erect, whereas the uh, wing sumac is going to have those similar type of fruit, but they're going to be drooping over. I the, think uh, later in the PowerPoint, I have the comparison of the twigs, too, are very different on there, so we'll show you the twigs later, too. Yeah, upright for smooth sumac and um, staghorns very upright too. They tend to be somewhat hairy 
and then the the winged or shining sumex fruits droop so that's a great way to separate the two see in the comments told you can boil these to make a tea um they actually the smooth sumac i think is the one that and i would do some homework before i recommend eating or tasting anything and you need to make sure you've got the right specimen but if you chew on the smooth sumac they do have a little bit of a lemony kind of taste to them and more wing seeds um, these are the ashes um, we've got white green and black ash, which black ash is not a very common ash anymore. It's in swampy areas. Actually, none of the ash are real common anymore unless they're seedlings. Um, and I probably shouldn't say none because blue ash does seem to be doing okay right now. And blue ash is the one with the square twigs that you're gonna find more in the Southwest and areas that have more limestone type soils. And then there are the acorns and we don't have time to go through all the acorns, but you really, for me, the best way to consistently ID oaks is by their acorns. And the things I look for are the size of the acorn, the cap and just what it looks like, like this one. Anybody know what that one is? It's a really large acorn too. And that is bur oak. Um, and that's where it gets its name. It has a burr looking acorn cap that covers more than half of the acorn. Um, this is your classic white oak acorn. It has more of a bumpy warty cap and you can't really see it or it broke off, but it usually has a short stalk, maybe a half, quarter to half inch long. Um, the acorns in the white oak group, typically if you find them on the ground this time of year they're going to have a root that's starting to come out of them or they're going to be splitting and ready to germinate in the fall where the red oak group won't be doing that until spring out of curiosity does anybody know the technical term for the stock of an acorn it's a really fun word to say i think it is it's one of my favorites yeah. actually wait a minute wait for it there it is oh there we go yeah yeah there we go uh this this one's known for its very long yeah Peduncle is correct. Great word to say. If you haven't said it in a while or never said the word peduncle, you should try it. It's great. The peduncle. And that is swamp white oak, which has the longest of all the peduncles. So if you find an acorn with a very long stalk or peduncle, it is fun to say, um, then that's a pretty good clue that it's swamp white oak. The other good clue is usually unless you're in an urban landscape, you're probably standing in a pretty wet area when you find these. And then a third clue, if you're in swamp white oak country and you're walking through areas where the leaves, some of them are upside down, they're very white or very light colored on the underside. Uh, their common name or their scientific name is Quercus bicolor and they're very whitish on the underside even after they hit the ground. There we go, that's what that looks like. Red oak acorns, these are three of the more common ones. And I've got this one bearing the one behind that's more typical, more of barrel shaped acorn with a cap that I always say looks like a little artist beret, little hat that sets on, very barely covers much of the acorn. That's the classic Northern red. Um, the black oak tends to be a fairly small acorn. A lot of times they'll look like a watermelon. They'll have some kind of streaks. And again, they're very, fairly small, they have a fringed cap. So when you look at it, it looks dry and the, the scales on the cap are fringed. And then this one's another common one in Southeast Ohio. If you look at the very tip of this acorn and see these concentric rings, and I don't know why that's true for scarlet oak, but it's the only oak that I know of that consistently has these rings around the base. Um, and that's again, scarlet oak, one of our dry site species. And the scarlet oak and black oak acorn should be about the same size. Yeah, I, I see some variation in the scarlet, but I don't see it in black. The blacks are almost always small. Um, pins, another really common one. It tends to be a very small acorn, but it has a cap that doesn't cover much of the acorn at all. Another hard fruit you're going to find on the ground. And even if it's not a good year for hickories, you tend to find the husk under the trees. Um, squirrels will move them, but under a hickory tree, typically you're going to find husk, and they're a great ID characteristic. Anybody know what we as foresters use to separate them? What characteristic of these 
hickory nuts or husk. We really look for to separate in to the different species of hickories. Any guesses? Sections. So the hickory nuts do have husks that split into sections where the walnut doesn't have sutures or splits. But how do we separate our hickories? So if we know it's a hickory, it's got um, husks that split into sutures or in, break into sections. We know it's a hickory. But how do we separate, say, shagbark hickory from mocker nut hickory from bitter nut hickory or pig nut hickory? Number of sections. I don't use that. There might be something to that. Do you know, Jim? Um, I think most of them split into four. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that, but it's the thickness. Somebody yeah. just put that, Chris put that. So if it's a very thick husk, and it, usually we're talking almost a half inch thick or so, then it's shag bark or shell bark. If it's a medium thickness husk, about a quarter inch or so, it's mocker nut typically. And then if it's very thin, like an eighth or so, then it's going to be pig nut or bitter nut. And the way you separate pig nut over here from bitter nut is bitter nut tends to have these ridges. Um, and when they split, they don't split completely. And you'll still see these kind of ridges right at the splits, a good ID characteristic. But just looking on the ground and find the husk is a great way to separate your hickories. And again, just for review, people always like to know this is shag bark, this is mocker nut, this one's pig nut, and this one's bitter nut hickory. You're seeing my mouse move there, Jim? Yes. I do that. And then conifers, we don't have a lot of native conifers, but cones are a great ID characteristic. Um, this is actually Virginia pine. And some of the things we look for with cones are the length of the cone. So if you're picking up cones on the ground, they're very elongated. Um, that might tell you something. We also look at these little tips of the cone scales and whether they're armed or not. I mean, these have sharp prickles that really would hurt you. Um, so whether it's armed and how sharp those points are is a good characteristic. And then just the shape and the size are great ID characteristics. Also, some species like Virginia pine hang on to old cones for years. Other species drop their cones to the ground almost that very first year. And then you've got this oddball. Um, this is Eastern red cedar, which technically these are cones, but they look like berries and they're called juniper berries. So the quiz for the day is what, what can be made out of juniper berries that help you get through COVID? It didn't take long. There's several <laughs> people answered that pretty quickly. Jen, good. Not something that I partake in much. It just doesn't work for me. So there are other few species that have cone-like fruits as well. This is actually an alder fruit. Um, the birch will have little cone-like structures as well. Um, this is actually black alder, a non-native um, tree that was planted a lot in, in coal mine country, especially for reclamation, because it also can fix nitrogen and help to reclaim a site. So any questions on fruit? I know it's a lot, we're throwing a lot at you. We're just trying to expose you to some different concepts and what we look at. Anything I need to add, Jim, on fruit at this point? Not at this point, on? I think. Okay. So flowers fall in winter, we kind of already blew this one, but that's what witch hazel flowers look like about this time of year. I'm seeing mine are just gorgeous right now as it starts to cool down. They also have probably the coolest fruit and I don't think I have a picture of it, I don't. Um, I love the fruit on witch hazel. They're a little, it looks like a little cone. They're kind of woody and they stay closed for a while but they've got this unique characteristic that when I don't know what drives it, I think it's more temperature and humidity um, where they'll pop open and they look like a little hippo mouth to me when they're open. Um, but they'll pop open and forcibly eject their seeds and throw them. So if you can find closed little capsules on witch hazel, put them on your desk and, and then in a few days you won't find the seeds, they'll be somewhere in the room. Um, so that's kind of a cool thing with witch hazel. And then there's form and shape. There are some trees that just have a nice classic shape. Any guess on what this might be? 
some trees have a nice central leader and it's very obvious that they have a central stem that grows. Others branch out more um, and I'm seeing elm pop up all, all over the place. The elms to me look like you took all the branches and stuck them in a big vase and they kind of just spread out like a flower arrangement. Um, other trees just texture in the winter. Um, this tree looks a little spooky about this time of year because it's got big fat branches um, and then you'll see the fruits hanging on. How about that one? Any guesses what that one might be? Got long kind of bean looking pods. Not sycamore, not walnut, not Kentucky coffee. Catalpa's popping now, good. Non-native to Ohio, but planted widely and you'll see it a lot. It's more native to the south, south and west of Ohio. And then I didn't mention oaks, but an open grown oak is kind of unique. In the woods, oaks, especially in the white oak group, will grow straight and tall when they're growing in competition. But if they're growing in the open, they tend to be about as wide or sometimes wider or broader than they are tall. They're almost rounded in the shape um, when they're open grown. Yeah, somebody put in the, the notes about uh, catalpa worms being really good fishing bait. Uh, it's the, uh, I think it's the caterpillar from uh, American hawk moth is what your catalpa worms are. And then location or site, this picture was not taken in Ohio. I don't know who I stole that from. Um, but where you're standing in nature makes a big difference when it comes to tree ID. And a lot of times process of elimination, classic is the oaks. I mean, if you're standing in a swamp, really wet area, it narrows it down pretty quickly to probably pin oak or swamp white oak. If you're on a very dry ridge, dry site, there's quite a few more species, but down here in the Southeast, it's scarlet oak and chestnut oak. It's really dry, you might find post oak and even blackjack oak if you're down along the river. So the location or site does matter. Um, and yes, that is cypress, but cypress will grow on a variety of sites. It's just where they compete best. Um, so in the landscape, all bets are off. I've seen bald cypress grow in fairly dry sites, but it happens to be where they compete best. And I think with bald cypress, the reason they grow in swamps so well is nothing else grows there well. And there, if you watch them, they don't leaf out till very late. They don't start actively growing till very late. If they're growing in competition with other trees, they're going to lose. But in a swamp, they've got an advantage because not much else can tolerate those conditions. Spanish moss is the clue. It'd be nice to be down in Spanish moss country today. We're going to switch gears a little bit and look at twigs. Lots of terms. Um, this is from the Woody Plants of Ohio. It's a, one of my favorite illustrations of a twig, um, but we're going to get into some of these twig characteristics. And it looks like she's illustrating a tree of heaven, one of Jim's favorite trees to kill <laughs> anyway, a non-native invasive plant. And then this is our Ohio buckeye. But we'll talk about a lot of these characteristics as we go, so I won't try to point it out on this diagram. But when it comes to winter ID, just like summer ID, leaf and bud arrangement and twig arrangement or branch arrangement, however you want to call it, is one of the great things to look for in the winter months. So if they, you want to look and see if these buds are arranged alternately, they alternate sides, or whether they're opposite and paired, or whether they're whirled, like the catalpa, which is one of the few, it's the only native, or it's the only tree that's pretty common, in Ohio that's whirled and that means you'll have actually three leaves or three buds at a node with the opposites will have two buds at a node and with the alternates there'll be a single bud at a node and a node, a node is just that point on the twig where you have buds so in this case we have a black walnut we have a box elder and then we have a northern catalpa and when it comes to opposite think mad buck Maple, ash, dogwood, and buckeyes. In the summer months, those are easy to separate into those groups. Maple leaves look totally different than ash leaves, which are totally different than dogwood and buckeye leaves. So those are, if you can remember opposite and mad buck, that gets you a long ways with most of our trees. There are a few exceptions. There's some non-native things. There's lots of shrubs that are opposite, but that's a good way to remember our trees that have that opposite branching. 
and not, not only are the buds and leaves opposite, but as those buds break and they, you start getting growth, you're going to have branch patterns, especially on the new growth that are also opposite as well. So here's a couple examples, our maples. This is sugar maple, a nice sharp pointed bud. You're going to find these little paired buds on the sides. And as you go further down the twig, the buds are going to be paired. And this is red maple, paired buds, paired buds again. So we can tell that's opposite and you'll start to see the opposite uh, branching on those as well. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I look for on maples is, especially during the winter, is that you, you're dealing with a pretty slender twig. Mm -hmm. That's very, one. very good thing to, to think about. It's something I sometimes forget to mention, but twig diameter is an awesome ID characteristic, at least in your mind. Think very fine, small diameter twig, probably got a small leaf. Very fat, large diameter twig like that Alanthus or Tree of Heaven, probably got a very large leaf. So there's a relationship between twig size and leaf size. And it's a common sense thing. You're not going to have a Alanthus leaf with 41 leaflets um, attached to a little twig that's an eighth of an inch in diameter. It wouldn't support it. So it makes sense. Here's an ash. You can see. Um, leaf scars are arranged oppositely. If you look here in the background, you see the branches are opposite. So the ash from a distance standing under them, you can look up and see opposite branching very easily. Buckeyes, not so much. And I'm not sure why, but it seems like they must just not, both branches must not survive and they must have lose more of them before they mature. But when I look up at a buckeye, I can't pick up the opposite branching near as well as I can with the ash. There's just a couple of the ash twigs. Um, this is one of my favorites. I have one growing on my property that I transplanted and the deer just hammered it this year. So I don't know if it'll make it or not, but it's, it's blue ash and it has a square twig. It actually has a four edges to it, which is really cool. And then this is green ash. Um, and the leaf scar tells me this is green ash versus white ash because white ash would have a nice horseshoe shaped leaf scar. I don't know if I can go back. Hard to see here, but it's kind of horseshoe shaped. This one up here maybe is a little easier to see versus this one's more rounded or typically flat across the top and rounded, like kind of like a D shaped. So, so one cool. way that I teach my students to tell the difference between like the white ash and the green ash, it's kind of a simple way. But if you're, if you're looking at uh, the green ash, I think of a, a green man or a Martian, he's going to ride around in his spaceship so that you kind of have that oval spaceship uh, sitting up on top of the, uh, the leaf scar. So the butt is sitting up on top where the white ash or the white man, he's riding around on a horse. So it's setting down in the saddle. So just kind of a simple never way. Heard the, never heard the Mar Martian one. Yeah, that's cool. green man. But yeah, right now, buds and twigs um, with ash, they, they work really well. Again, you can see there's a, a bud here, the other one's behind it. And then with most of our opposites, you're going to have three buds at the tip. You're going to have these two side or lateral buds and then one at the tip. Um, so that's what we call the terminal bud at the tip of the twig. And this one, any guesses what that might be? Kind of looks like somebody's flipping the bird to me, but but you have a terminal bud that's larger and these buds on the side are very small kind of a reddish twig depending on it's the underside or the top of the twig it can be green or red um, this is actually flowering dogwood believe it or not that's a flowering dogwood twig so again just look at that characteristic and that'll kind of stick in your brain and when you see that you'll know that's flowering dogwood So buckeyes, we've got two native ones down here. Um, just twigs alone, you can separate some differences. This one's a little more elongated. Um, this is the Ohio buckeye. And, and if you look at the keys, it'll say the scales are keeled. So the term keel, has anybody heard that before? Where have you seen it? Think of a boat and the center line on the boat is the keel. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see a distinct keel on those bud scales with Ohio buckeye. They're not going to be keeled on the yellow buckeye. And then another great way to do that or to separate those, if you scratch the Ohio buckeye twig, it's going to have an odor. It's kind of offensive. It almost smells a little skunky, um, but it's a much stronger on Ohio buckeye. Another common name for that 
is fetid buckeye. So those are our buckeyes. Shifting gears quite a bit, but the other thing I like to look at is the bud on the tip. It's called the terminal bud. And one and of my we have a question: If you could discuss the difference between a leaf scar and a bud scar. Hmm. We hear the term bud scar much, do you, Jim? Well, I think the the question is determining the difference between a leaf scar and a bud. And a bud. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. We'll yeah, we'll show apologies. some more pictures, but in this example. Um, does anybody know what this cool looking duck bill bud is? Usually a greenish or purplish color. Mm -hmm. Tulip, tulip poplar, yellow poplar or tulip tree. So that's a bud. So these are buds. And the buds basically next year's vegetation or next year's flowers packed into a structure. And that's, what, that's the form you're gonna see in the winter. They'll break bud in the spring. The growth will come out of that bud or the flowers will come out of that bud. We'll show you some flower buds later. But then right, and these pictures aren't the best, but right where the leaf was attached, once the leaf falls off, you're gonna have a, it's usually flattened, it may be a little sunken, but it's gonna be a little st structure where the leaf was attached. And we'll show you more examples and explain that a little bit more as we go. But if you think about the leaf scar, it's where the leaf was attached and it's the mirror image of what the base of the leaf would look like or the base of the petiole on the leaf. So these examples, yellow poplar, if you're seeing a cluster of buds at the tip, that's a really good indicator of it being an oak. If they're alternate and you're gonna have more than three buds and they're different sizes and shapes and kind of look to me like a knuckle sandwich, then it's an oak and that's a white oak in this example. Some tree species have a terminal bud that just looks different. The one on the tip looks different. And with um, yellow poplar, they're little what we call valvate scales. There's two that come together. And this one looks like a duckbill. If you're really bored or got kids, peel those open and delicately take them apart. And you're gonna see all of next year's leaves kind of packed in there. They're folded in half and they're little miniature tulip leaves inside there. Other species will have what we call pseudo or false terminal buds. So the, the buds on the side look a lot like the bud on the tip. And what happens is they'll continue to grow until the conditions aren't right. And then the twig just dies back to the last side bud or lateral bud. With trees with a true terminal bud, it's kind of predetermined. They'll grow so much, they'll set a new terminal bud and they're done for the year. So again, we've got yellow poplar, we've got white oak here in the middle. And then over here we have persimmon. So here's just some examples of some oaks. All clusters of buds at the tip. These are more rounded. If they're more rounded, they typically are in the white oak group. If they're sharp and pointed, they typically are in the red oak group. It doesn't hold true perfectly. But this is black oak here in the middle, a little bit hairy, sharp pointed buds. And then these unique little structures between the buds is very unique for burr oak those little stringy structures between the buds. So we've got white oak, black oak. This is actually swamp white, which I couldn't probably tell you the difference between swamp white and white oak buds without a little help from where I'm looking at it. And then this is bur oak down here. There's just some examples of some species of lateral buds. We've got an elm over here. A lot of times um, the alternates will have a nice zigzag pattern. This is uh, American sycamore. The buds are on the side. And I don't know if I have a better picture or not. I actually have a sycamore twig here that we can look at, but it has a unique thing where the leaf scar completely circles the bud and the bud hides under the leaf scar. Another great ID characteristic is, is bud length. Um, Probably one of the more extremes that's fairly common if it's a long cigar shaped bud like this. Any guesses what that might be? A little more pointed than a cigar, but um, kind of the same color and kind of elongated. American beech, good. We've also um, a fairly long bud, maybe half inch or so, is service berry. And then here's some examples of just relatively short buds. This is a black cherry bud. And there's some species where you look really hard, you just can't see buds. Buds are kind of sunken under the surface of the twig. And this one down here is a sourwood. 
So bud length, something to look for. We can't go through all the trees today, but it just things to keep in mind that separate. And then we'll talk about how you might find some keys to help you separate them. And then here in Jackson County, we're very lucky to have two species with very long buds. And I was out at Lake Catherine State Nature Reserve and saw tons of this one yesterday. It's called um, Umbrella Magnolia. And these, this picture is not great. The lighting wasn't good that day, but this is a green, kind of a smooth, almost waxy coated bud can be very long. And that is the Umbrella Magnolia. And this is a fuzzy, silvery, hairy bud. And that's the Big Leaf Magnolia. Um, big Leaf Magnolia only occurs naturally here in Jackson County. The Umbrella Magnolia has a little bit bigger range, but, and you'll find it down along the river as well. But they're two very unique species that are, are native to Ohio. And then we've also got some trees that have flower buds that are preset, preformed in the winter. And you'll find them out there right now. Uh, the one on the right, does that look familiar to anybody? Any guesses? Dogwood. Yep. So the flowering dogwood has this big swollen preformed bud. It looks like a pumpkin to me um, on the tip, tips of many of the twigs. What about the one on the left? The flower buds are actually these little round ones down here. Pawpaw, good. So the pawpaw has a very fine um, kind of hairy bud that really we're looking at a bud that's um, not got anything covering it, but the flower buds are these swollen buds down here and they're preformed. There's another one, if we see pairs of buds on a little shrub, it's a pretty good indicator that, that these flower buds are spice bush, a native shrub that is pretty common in our wooded settings in Ohio, much of Ohio. And on spice bush, if you're looking for the leaf buds, they're almost impossible to see. You may just see like a wee little red dot, and that's about it. But those flower buds are really what show up in the wintertime for spice bush. So bud scales. We'll talk a little bit about bud scales. All these three species shown here are in the same genus. They're very closely related. Anybody want to guess the genus? The group of trees, for instance, a group of trees might be oaks or walnuts. What's this group? Anyone, anybody want to guess? Those are hickories. So we look at these three twigs from three hickories. They look totally different. This one has this bright yellow bud that they're what they call valvate. Um, just a few bud scales you're seeing where they kind of almost look naked where they don't have bud scales. This one has, um, you'll see a few bud scales, but the old bud scales along the edges fall off. And then this one hangs onto those bud scales, those old bud scales. So this is bitternut hickory. This is mocker nut hickory. And then this is king nut or shell bark hickory, which looks a lot like um, shag bark hickory as well, but they hold both shag bark and king nut hold on to these old scales. So if you think it's a hickory, look at the terminal buds and just whether they have scales or not, and whether those old scales are deciduous is a great way to separate the hickories. Also twig size, um, shag bark and mocker nut twigs are pretty fat and big, bitter nut and pig nut uh, twigs are, are quite a bit smaller in diameter usually. Anything else to add to the hickories, Jim, and bud scales? No, not really. Um, just the, the one thing that, you know, the probably the easiest hickory to recognize is that one over there on the left, the bitter nut hickory, because it's got that naked bud, meaning no scales on the bud. So it's all that rudimentary uh, leaf foliage, essentially. And, and it's bright yellow. It's yep. like sulfur or sulfur yellow. Also texture of twigs. Um, Mocker nut hickory twigs got a little bit of hairiness and the buds got some hairiness and even the rachis, which is a term we haven't talked about yet, but we'll talk about here in a second, whether it's got hairiness or not, it's another good ID characteristic. These are two common species, not real common, this one's not super common. Species you'll find in the woods that the leaves sometimes can look almost identical. So even in the summer, looking at bud scales can help you. This one, it's hard to see it's fuzzy you're seeing these little lines. Those are all bud scales. And all scales are, think of shingles covering a roof. 
They're just things that cover up and protect the bud. This mulberry has usually four or more, lots more, where basswood usually has a couple bud scales and they, you've got one kind of rounded one, another one kind of covering it up. So even though these, um, if you got a mulberry that doesn't have the, the sinuses or the cuts in the leaf, it looks a lot like a basswood, but we can look at bud scales and separate those out pretty easily. So pay attention to that detail. A good hand lens is not a bad thing to have with you. Although probably one of the better things, it works just as well for me and it doesn't work with my background, but a, a cell phone, take a good clear picture and zoom in with your phone and you can see that detail. Sometimes that's a, a good little clue to have with you. The other thing is take those good clear pictures and send them around. We'll show you how you might be able to get some help to identify stuff too, if you've got good pictures. So on the leaf scar, someone asked what a leaf scar was. This is where the base of that leaf was attached before it fell off. And these little dots are what we call bundle scars. So as water is carried up in a tree, it goes through some piping. It's a simple, like a piping network. And the connection between the twig and the leaf are these bundle scars. And the arrangement, the shape of that leaf scar and the arrangement of these little scars within the leaf scar are a good ID characteristic. Um, Someone mentioned, I thought I saw, yeah, monkey face for the hickories. Well, hickories and walnuts are pretty closely related. They're in the same family. And they'll have kind of a monkey face look to them. Where the leaf scar of an ash, this is the white ash in the, the saddle that Jim was talking about earlier. The shape of that is U-shaped. That's a good way to separate. But even starting to look even closer at, okay, what's the arrangement of those little dots Here's an American sycamore where the leaf scar completely circles the bud. So in the summer, you're looking for buds and you can't see them. What you see is the base of that leaf or the petiole covering that bud. But when it falls off, you're gonna have a scar that completely encircles that bud and you're gonna see the little bundle scars around the edge. Um, the buds are nice and cone shaped and eventually they turn this kind of rusty red as well. Here's a leaf scar of a Kentucky coffee tree and a little cheat on the pith. That's got a kind of a salmon colored pith, which we'll talk about the center of the twig here in a little bit. Dave, we also have a related question. Do the buds make the flowers and the leaves and do the leaves have their own buds? So it depends on the species. Some species have a vegetative bud that everything's kind of packed in there. And when they start to grow, the, the leaves, uh, the branch will grow. You'll have um, that new growth may have flower buds on it later in the year. And then some have special flower buds that occur. And the, most of the ones that I are real common that we pay the most attention to, we've already mentioned. Um, pawpaw has a preformed flower bud. That's very obvious. Uh, flowering dogwood has a preformed flower bud. Spice bush does. Can you think of many others, Jim? Not off the top of my head, those were the three kind of the most obvious ones. So you may have separate flower buds or you may have all the vet new growth that's packed in the same bud. Great question. So here are two tree species have similar names. I'm not sure how closely related they are, but they do have something in common is that the bundle scars are three nice little ones. And I just noticed this looks a little bit like Bucky Buckeye there on this um, sweet gum his little eyes and nose, but three bundle scars. This is sweet gum, three nice bundle scars here, not quite as clear as these, and this is black gum. So that's something else to look at is those bundle scars. And then to wrap up this PowerPoint, we got a few more slides, so bear with us, but you got a lot of spiky things that can hurt you on a tree. And if you learn the differences between things called thorn spines and spur shoots, it can help you identify. So a lot of people just call all these thorns, but if you have thorns that don't have buds along them, then that's a true thorn. If you have these spiky things, but you're gonna see little buds along them, um, these are called spur shoots. So a lot of our fruit producing trees have these little short branches that have buds on them. And that's where the, flower, the fruit is produced. The flowers and the fruit are produced on those really short 
but stout little twigs. So this is American plum. Actually, this is crab, crab apple. But American plum has a very similar looking little spur shoot or apple trees will have that as well. And the, the fruits and the flowers are produced on these little short stalks. This is hawthorn, which usually has single um, thorns, but some of the varieties of hawthorns can have branch thorns. Yeah. And some of those spur shoots that, that you were talking about, Dave, um, can be very sharp. They can hurt. And they can look like thorns and feel like thorns, especially that on like autumn olive. Um, I see that quite a bit on that non-native invasive plant. Privet will do that too, some of the privets. This is honey locust, uh, the native variety. Um, if, if they're not horticultural, you'll, a lot of times you'll find the whole trunk covered up, but I'm not sure why sometimes they do have that. Sometimes you'll find them out in the wild that don't have a lot of thorns other than out on the twigs. But um, honey locust thorns are branched. The, the species name is triacanthos, so they tend to be branch thorns. And then we've got these paired thorns or technically spines. They're actually uh, spines that occur right where the leaf scar was. And this is black locust. These little paired spines are a great indicator of black locust. Um, only one other woody plant um, that I can think of that has the paired spines like that. Um, but black locust thorns or spines can be very variable too. Sometimes you'll just see little almost like hair-like structures, structures and sometimes you'll find pretty long thorns. There's a lot of genetic variation. Anybody know what the other, it's a shrub that has uh, spines that look very similar to this? Pretty much, pretty common in Northwestern and, and you'll, you'll usually find a little rusty red bud right in the middle. And if you got a toothache, you can chew on it. It's supposed to help with that. In my dendrology classes, pretty much every year I'm able to get students to, to chew on, as Debbie mentions, their prickly ash. And prickly ash. Uh, if you're Good. dedicated, you can, you can make your mouth go numb. <laughs> All honey locusts needs to be extinct. That might be a little strong. Actually, they do have some value. Those pods that they produce will be fed on in the winter months, and they're very sugary. Um, when I was in college, we even tried to make persimmon... Uh, honey locust beer but it didn't turn out too good but there's supposedly you can do that yeah i mean i've seen deer eat the the pods of honey locust it's kind of humorous to see them walking through the woods with a big pod sticking out the side but yeah when there's snow cover and there's not a lot else out there they 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 tend to really go after them actually we do have a black locust boar i don't know about a honey locust boar. <laughs> this is one i just like it's called hercules club or devil's walking stick is and it is native kind of scattered. I see it a lot in the Hocking Hills. Stumbled into some in Benton County the other day. And somebody wants to explain why honey locusts should be extinct. Probably because of flat tires or a lot of pain from those thorns. And if you get a puncture wound from honey locusts, a lot of times they will get swollen and infected and it, it can be nasty. But they'll go through a tractor tire. They're, they're amazing. And then one of the last things I want to talk about is pith. I don't talk about pith a lot. It's not my starting point when I'm trying to identify something, but it might be that point that I say, well, I'm not 100% sure. So I'm going to uh, use the pith to separate and it, I have to look it up every time, but you can separate the red twig dogwoods or the, the non-flowering dogwoods that are more shrubby based on their pith and the color. Um, so that's one place you would use it. But the three types of pith, this is an oak, just a solid pith, nothing to get excited about. This is what we call a diaphragm pith. You cut into that twig, it's going to have a spongy center. And then this is what we call chambered. So when you cut into that twig, you're going to see these big open voids or chambers in the center of the pith. So there are a few species that have diaphragm pith. Black gum is a great diagnostic. Actually, yellow poplar will have that as well. And then there are very few that have a chambered pith and walnut's the one that comes to mind most of the time with that. Um, and I, what's kind of interesting, if you split much firewood, you'll find that pith in the center of a log this big around. It still maintains that chambered um, nature. And if you, if you split it with a log splitter or with a maul, it usually splits right through that pith or right close to it. 
So pith is another thing that you can look at if you want to identify trees. Some trees have a real hollow pith, like this one. Anybody know that one? I've seen tree stems this big around with a big hollow center in the middle. And Jim's probably cut down a few of those or treated a few of those over the years too. Anybody know that one? Anybody from Scioto or Lawrence County? It's working its way to the north. This is a non-native um, invasive plant that's um, pretty aggressive, very prolific seeder and grows crazy fast. I've seen inch to two inches in diameter growth on these things in a, in a growing season. No guesses yet. Nope, not tree of heaven. No, I think this one can... has big more heart-shaped leaves. When it's mature, I think it can produce either 15 to 20 million seeds per year. Polonia. So Sarah got that one. Royal Polonia. Non-native one that especially since about 2003, I've seen this thing kind of explode in South, in the Southern part of the state. It um, used to think it couldn't tolerate colder temperatures. And if it gets an extreme winter, it might kill a small one back to the ground, but it doesn't kill the root system. And within a year, I've seen them 15 feet tall again because the root system will grow so fast. But look up Polonia. That's one that's starting to really concern us and has for the last 10 or so years. And then other things to pay attention to. What's the twig color? Um, this is sassafras. It always has a green twig on the new growth. And actually, some of the little bit older growth is still green. And you might see some tinges of orange. Um, there's one oppositely um, arranged tree that has opposite leaf arrangement that the twigs are very green. Great ID characteristic, kind of whitish buds, rounded and green twigs. Anybody know what that one might be? Box elder, good. Yeah, Debbie's got it. And then we've got some that have these weird growth forms and not always, but this one is sweet gum and it gives you some really cool texture in the winter months. Um, Bur oak has some interesting texture to its twig growth too. It'll get these big corky ridges. So just pay attention to that kind of detail. Here are the three sumacs. Smooth sumac actually has a glaucous bloom or a waxy coat. Um, anybody here old enough to remember waxing their car? Instead of just driving through <laughs> the car wash, you actually put on this paste wax and it turns kind of a whitish color and then when you polish it turtle wax there you go when you polish it it shines well um smooth sumac will do that if you rub on that twig with a cloth or with your shirt or whatever it'll shine kind of like an apple before you eat it um big fat twig this is winged sumac which is a much smaller diameter twig with these bumpy warts on it and then this one gets its name staghorn sumac because it it looks like a a deer's antler in velvet. It's got these little short hairs on it. So we can separate those through sumacs just on the twigs and they're very, very different. They don't look anything alike really to me. Leaf scars look kind of similar on them, but one's kind of smooth, usually kind of a pinkish purplish color and then you wax it up and it gets real shiny. Another one's got these bumps or warts or we call them linosols. They're kind of just little structures that allow gas exchange on the twig, kind of like the stomates on the leaf. And then the hairiness is the uh, staghorn sumac. There's another little shrub. Jim asked me to add that one, so I'll let him talk about that one. It's got little short hairs all over it. And one of my favorites, if I can get the fruit before the squirrels do. Dan, this is actually a, a fruit that, um, at least for the ones that are were around me, um, did a fair amount of producing a fruit this year, more so than I've seen in previous years. Does anybody know what this little guy is? But one of the, the really good winter identifying features are these, um, especially in the wintertime, you'll have these little, really small, stiff, little black hairs. Um, yeah, um, that is correct. That is a, a hazelnut. And so at least for whatever reason, I don't know whether the weather cooperated just right um, when it was flowering, but uh, a lot of hazelnuts this year. So we've got um, is it American hazelnut, the most common one. There is a, a northern hazelnut, beaked hazelnut, you'll see in the northern part of the state. And then there are some non-native ones that they're trying to grow for a food crop that you'll 
you won't find very commonly in Ohio. But hazelnut's one of my favorites. It's a multi-stem shrub usually grown along edges and it will, you'll find it into the woods a little bit, but it usually doesn't produce fruit very well in the woods. It, you almost have to be in a little bit more light. And then the last one, the last few last things we're gonna talk about, these are preformed male flowers or catkins. And usually you're gonna find these in things that are related to birch. So either birch, um, hazelnut actually will have them as well. And then the alders, which aren't relatives, will have preformed flowers like this or catkins. There's one of the alders, that's black alder. And then finally, something we don't see in many winter tree ID keys, but the rachis. So on a compound leaf, you've got this stem or stalk that falls off when the leaf hits the ground. And they'll usually not go very far. So the rachis is something that you can pick up. And if you look closely, you'll see these little bumps. So if you rub your fingers along that rachis, you can count how many leaflets it had. So I can actually pick up the rachis from a hickory, rub my fingers along, and I'm going to feel pairs of bumps until I get to the tip. And there's always three leaflets, almost always three leaflets at the tip. I can count leaflet numbers. So I can use leaf ID in the winter, even when the leaves aren't there. You just got the rachis. If it's a buckeye with a palmately compound leaf, you're going to find a little short rachis, and you'll see these little scars at the tip where there'll be five, usually little scars where those leaflets were attached. So that's another thing to look for under the tree. If you go under walnuts in an area that the grass isn't mowed all the time and blown away, you're going to find those rake, rake eye, I guess is the term, all underneath those trees. So with that, that's all we had on the tree ID portion of the PowerPoint. A couple publications you might want to look for is this, uh, it's an oldie but a goodie. It was produced back in the 40s, but it's a twig and fruit key got really good old black and white photos. There's a whole section, and I forget which is in the front and which is in the back. I think the twig keys and the, well, it looks like the fruit key, the way it's organized on the title. But it'll, it'll actually have good pictures of all the types of fruits of most of our native trees, and then there'll be good pictures of the twigs as well. Um, I can use, still find these a lot of times online for like 10, 12 bucks. So it's a, it's a nice little little thing to have on your shelf. Harlow is the author, and it's the fruit, fruit and Twig Key to Trees and Shrubs. There's another book that Jim recommended. I've used it a bit. It's got really good photos. It's uh, Woody Plants of Kentucky and Tennessee, and it's a winter ID guide. Got really good, nice, clear, crisp photos. And if you're interested in edibles, that uh, the last book there, the um, is contains a fair amount of information on um, uses for the tree, um, including edibles and so forth. Cool. That's the University of Kentucky Press, Woody Plants of Kentucky and Tennessee. Um, there aren't many plants we have in Ohio that aren't in Kentucky and Tennessee. Some of our northern species might not be found there. And then Jim, do you want to try to give that a shot with the Virginia yeah, Tech we'll Key? We'll see if uh, I can. I'm going to stop my screen share. And um, Virginia Tech University has a great online tree ID resource. Um, and they also have an app. And they actually have a winter twig key that you can use. So let's see, do I have you to where you can share? So okay. it's, when I'm clicking on the uh, share screen, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, I gotta make you a co-host here. I gotta find you here. I got so many windows open. Give me just a second. So what we're gonna be uh, walking you through is um, a website um, that Virginia Tech has put together on tree identification. And Try it now, Jim. I'm gonna walk through a key, which is basically a set of um, question that, that you answer. So it should be seeing kind of a split screen on my end now, Dave, is that correct? Oh, you're, you're muted, Dave. Yes. Okay, so essentially what we have here is if you go to, um, pull this down and around, um, if you go to Google um, 
all I've done here is just done a search for Virginia Tech Dendrology. And if you go down here to ID keys, um, this is a really great way to uh, be able to identify things in the wintertime. So if you're not exactly sure by looking at the twig, what you have um, in front of you, um, basically there's this flow chart that you can work through that can help you identify what it is that you have. So since we're in the winter time where most of the leaves aren't available, we'll click here on this twig ski. And essentially what you're gonna be doing is answering some questions. So, um, so I'm gonna scroll down here to Ohio. And what this will do is it will limit the results to species that are gonna be commonly found in Ohio. And then we just hit next. Um, and then what we're gonna do is start answering these questions. And so we're gonna answer these questions um, for the twigs that we have over here um, on the right. And so uh, this is one that you probably wouldn't know uh, just by looking at the photo, but if you collected the twig, you would probably know that this is something that's coming from a tree. Um, so trees generally are defined as something greater than 20 foot tall and usually have single stems, whereas the shrubs uh, usually less than 20 foot tall and usually have um, multiple stems coming up from the ground but this would be uh, coming from a tree. Um, then we'll hit essentially display matching species. And basically the further we go down with this, the more questions we answer, the smaller the list will get. So at this point, um, there's 170 different trees that, that'll pop up. So we wanna answer some more questions. So how are the leaf scars and buds arranged? So if we take a look over here at the, the buds, uh, at the nodes, you'll notice that this is um, opposite. So you have two buds at the node. So we'll click opposite, um, click once again, and then um, so we can click on, let's uh, narrow our choices, shape of the leaf scar. So are we dealing with a really uh, broad leaf scar uh, or kind of more of a rather narrow leaf scar? Um, and if at any point you're, you're really not sure is the, the answer to the question, you can always select, I don't know, um, but I'm gonna say that you're dealing with a pretty narrow leaf scar. So we will continue on. Um, and then it's gonna ask us a question about uh, the shape of the end bud. Um, so is it tall and pointed, short and round or no end bud? So if we take a look at the end bud here, it is tall and pointed. So then we should come up with our, um, uh, another question here, let's narrow the choices by looking at uh, the terminal bud. So. Is it naked, meaning that it doesn't have scales, uh, valvate, um, and it should give you a, an ex a definition for what valvate is. So valvate is um, basically two bud scales um, that meet but don't overlap at the edge. Um, are we dealing with a scaly bud or are we dealing with a fuzzy one? Um, here, I would say that this is definitely uh, scales. You can see those multiple scales. So we will select that it is scaly bud. All right, um, so oaks and a few other groups have many end buds. Um, does your twig have many end buds? Um, and so you can see uh, a description here. Um, so are there more than three end buds or are there three or fewer end buds? So if we look at the end bud, so we have one dominant one here and then we have kind of the two opposite of each other right there at the base. So this would be three or fewer end buds and we can scroll down some more. And then it's going to ask us about thorns and spines. And uh, I don't see any thorns or spines on this. So we'll say that it is lacking spines or thorns. And so essentially what we have now is a list of oh, one more, one more question. Let's narrow our choices by examining the number of vascular bundle scars in the leaf scar. Um, so does it have one, three, five or more. Um, and actually, I'm not sure the, the correct answer for this one, but I know it has at least uh, one and I can't really see whether it has three or more. So I'm just going to select that I don't know because um, I can't see. If you had the entire twig in front of you, you could probably answer that question. But essentially what you're given here is a list of species to pick from. And Unfortunately, apparently I uh, answered one of the questions wrong. Um, Dave, do you know which question I took a, uh, a bad step I on? I do. Um, and I, it, it's 
it's not that you took a bad step is that your picture is not very representative and that is the end bud is more rounded instead of long and narrow most of the buds of this species have more of a rounded one so if you go short yeah so we'll change that answer um, so one of the things that um, i always like to do whenever i'm working my way through a key is start with a species that i know um, and work through it and make sure that i can work through the two and get the correct answer um, and that can kind of help simplify things and perhaps help you from identifying something wrong in front of 130 or 140 people um, did it pop this time? Yeah, that did it. One yeah. thing while we're trying to key this out, um, there have been several folks who have raised their hand. Please okay. put your question in the chat or the Q&A if you do have a question. Um, so at this point, once you get it narrowed down to a group of species, um, what you can do is start looking at some pictures and see what matches up. Um, in this case, um, looking at uh, a red maple, you can pull that up and kind of take a look at more similar um, looking twig. Um, we'll see if I can do one correctly. And, and their key has a long bud too. So yeah, I know. <laughs> you know the, the long and skinny and short and fat kind of thing questions are, are not 100%. It's not a yes or no, there's a gradation. So sometimes you have to back up a little bit. Okay, so we'll start out with this one and see if we can do this one uh, correctly. Um, so this is going to be one that we are, um, we know that is coming from a tree. Um, so greater than 20 foot tall, single stem, and hopefully that's something that you'll be able to identify when you're collecting the uh, twig out in the field. Um, how many, uh, or how are the leaf scars arranged? So um, essentially you're dealing with one bud at a node. So this is going to be alternately branched. So we'll select that. Um, click for our next question. Uh, let's narrow choices based on the shape of the leaf scar. Um, and so our choices are, are broad or narrow. Um, this is one that I would once again consider to be broad. find our next question. Let's narrow our choices based on the shape of the end bud. And so the question here is whether it's um, tall and pointed, uh, short and round, uh, or no end bud. Um, I would kind of consider this a somewhat of a tall and pointed. We'll see if I, I go wrong on this one again, but hopefully I do not. Um, and one of the things that you may find with certain keys is that regardless of how you answer that question, of whether it's tall and pointed or short and rounded, you may still end up having the, the correct choice given at the bottom. Unfortunately, when I worked through it, I did not have that happen, but uh, so. So I think kind of the, I don't know where their break is, Jim, on that, but typically like a lot of those keys, short and round means they're about as wide as they are tall versus elongated or, or much longer than they are tall, so. So we'll take at the uh, look at the the terminal bud, and so we have naked buds. Um, so we uh, we do have a couple scales there. Valve bud. We have more than a couple scales. Um, we have scaly, and then we have fuzzy. So if, taking a look at the bud on here, uh, you can kind of see that fuzz uh, along those scales. So this is one that I will consider uh, fuzzy. Okay. Um, next question is about uh, your twig and how many end buds that it has. So here we just have one end bud. So it's not like the red maple that we looked at last that had a couple additional buds. So this one has a um, single one or three or fewer. And next question is about thorns or spines. Once again, when we look at this, we don't have any uh, thorns or spines attached to the the twig. So we'll select that it is lacking those. And looking at the vascular bundle scars. And so again, looking at the leaf scar, looking at the number of dots or kind of those, the number of tubes that are in there, um, greater than five. Uh, at least I can see what I think to be greater than five of those little dots in there. So I would select that one. And straightness of the twig. So some trees 
are going to have a very zigzag shaped twig. Others are going to remain pretty straight, at least of what we can see of this one. It's going to be a pretty straight twig. And then uh, does our twig have any special features? So does it have fuzz on the twigs? Uh, does it have any catkins, as you can see, or any corky ridges? Here on this one, if we're looking um, up here at the new growth part of the twig, you can see that it's just about as fuzzy as the buds were. Um, so I would say that this does have uh, fuzz on the buds um, or fuzz on the twigs as well. And once we get to that point, we are given one choice, which in fact, this is what that is. And lo and behold, you can see where I stole the picture from this morning, um, Virginia Tech, and this is a mocker nut hickory. So that's just a, a way to um, help you break down um, and identify a tree based upon the features that you are seeing. Um, a lot of times um, it's a lot easier when you have the, the twig right there in uh, front of you and you can kind of see and you can touch it. Um, but uh, with this there, you know, there are times when, you know, you answer a question wrong and all of a sudden you uh, don't get uh, to the answer. So as I, as I demonstrated earlier, they're not idiot proof. Um, but for the most part, it can help give you some clues as to what it might be. And one of the other really nice things about this Virginia Tech website is, um, so say we, we keyed this out to be a mocker nut hickory, but it just for whatever reason doesn't necessarily look exactly like a mocker nut hickory. Um, it's going to give you some other choices that you'll see up here, uh, like pig nut hickory, shag bark hickory, shell bark hickory. So some other species that would look similar that you might be able to, to click on and, and perhaps um, take a little bit of a closer look at. Okay, so I think with that, Dave, I will stop sharing my screen and okay. we can jump into the, the next section. Thanks. And we're running a little long here. So in, folks, um, about all we've got left is we were just going to share some tree bark videos. And if you can't hang on, we'll make those videos available. I'll probably loop them all together or stick them on the web page. It's going to take me a while to figure out how to do it because I got a bunch of them. But um, nothing that we're going to help you <laughs> that much with bark ID as much as just seeing it and knowing what species it is. So if we don't get through many of those, um, realize that we'll make those videos available on the web page that we shared earlier. Um, just a couple more words on the Virginia Tech site. The key is not perfect and it's based on an average of things. So there's variation with individual trees. So when you're looking for a twig or a leaf on the key, try to find something that's representative. And remember tree species are not identical. So there's variation within a species. So the key's not gonna be perfect. Um, the simpler the key is, the less precise it's going to be, but if it's too complicated and it starts asking for number number or flower characteristics or things like that or number of petals on a flower or, or, or stamens on a flower, then then you're not going to be able to use it. So realize there's a little trade-off between how good it is. But the thing I love is once you get to that species, you can print out a single page that has all those identifying characteristics. And I love to print those out for, say, my property and create my own tree ID key for my own property. So Virginia Tech also has a phone app that you can download for free that works very well. And it actually knows where you are and it can narrow the list based on where you're located. So that's another really nice feature of, and things that Virginia Tech provides. So at this point, let's take some questions. And Danny, you want to help us out and make sure we're not missing stuff? Yeah, we'll start with the few out of the chat that I saw. Um, the first one was, what is the main difference between the black and red slash scarlet oak? Jim, you, uh, you're muted too. <laughs> we were both muted. He might be talking. So I think that question um, came up when we were talking about the bark, if I recall correctly, Dave. So when I um, think about comparing red oak, black oak, and scarlet oak, um, I typically am looking for uh, kind of like these ski trails. So these long streaks that come down the tree, you'll commonly see that on uh, red oak. Um, I tend to think of the, 
the black oak is being much more blocky. Um, so it may have a little bit of a ski trail look to it. So you'll see some of these uh, streaks coming down in black oak. But for the most part, especially as you get down towards the base of that tree, um, it'll start to get a lot more blocky. Um, and then with scarlet oak, it's actually sort of a combination of the two. So up higher on the tree, it'll look very much like red oak ski trails um, and then get a little bit more blocky at the bottom. But the, a couple of things that you'll commonly see on scarlet oak is one of which um, the bases of scarlet will be very swelled. Um, and actually that's because it gets the, um, it suffers from this uh, chestnut blight. And so the disease that is responsible for primarily wiping out uh, most of the American chestnut in the Eastern forest, um, scarlet oak is impacted by that, but it's not killed from it. Um, but it'll basically get a um, very large uh, swollen base from that. And then the other thing with scarlet oak is you oftentimes have a lot of um, dead low branches on there that will tend to persist and hang on. Are you seeing my little traffic cone? I am. Yes. Th this is the bark of northern red oak from a distance. And oh, let me pause it here. Ah, pause doesn't work. <laughs> These streaks are what Jim is talking, is talking about on northern red oak. So it'll have these vertical streaks on it. And let's try it. I should have black oak here. Another way to look at those streaks is that the tree almost looks like it has stretch marks. So imagine you know, the stretching of the skin kind of looks like that as well. Black oak is more blocky from bottom to top. It almost looks the same. Another thing is if you're really unsure, if you take a pocket knife and just right in the little fissure in the bark, so let me pull up this close up of black oak. Right in the fissure of the bark, if you take a pocket knife and just barely penetrate that with black oak, it's going to be almost yellow. Right in these grooves or fissure, fissures with red oak, it's going to be more salmon colored. So that was just a couple examples of those videos that, that I pulled together. And I'll, I'll try to find a way to share those bark videos. I don't know if I can upload them all or whether I need to string a bunch together and and uh, put names on them, but it, it'll, it's gonna take me a little while. Um, but we do have those videos available that we'll share. Um, other questions? And then when we're done with everything else, I can stay around and play a few of those videos and we can talk about them, but I don't, I know we're a little bit over our time and I don't wanna hold people up. So I wanna kind of put a, oh, a wrap on it. One question we had was about wild plum, but I did refer them to the tree IDs uh, the go.osu.edu. Yep. We do have a short video on plum. Uh, plum is one of my favorites. I typically find it in fairly low lying areas, stream side or down low, and it's a very prolific flowerer normally, but rarely do the fruit make it to maturity. Um, I don't know whether it's disease or insect problems or just critters getting them, but rarely do you find our um, native plum producing much fruit that we can take advantage of, but they're sure beautiful in the spring. Yeah, I've got a patch of American plum on my property in the eight or nine years that I've been out there. I think we've had one really exceptional year where there were probably hundreds, if not maybe thousands of plums in this patch. And then the other seven or eight years, there might've been like 20 fruits produced. So Yeah, and they'll usually start producing them. You'll see green ones hanging on, but before they get ripe, they just kind of disappear and I've never quite figured out what's going on. Great question though. Our next question is red buckeye or horse chestnut seedling. Um, would you be able to, or would the seedling mature to a red buckeye or horse chestnut or would it revert back to a buckeye? Like a plain buckeye. Jim, you want to take that or I so can attempt. Um, essentially, I think to kind of answer the question, red buckeye is a, is a unique species, the same that Ohio buckeye or yellow buckeye is a species. Um, and so if it is a true red buckeye, when you would plant that fruit, um, it would remain a, a red buckeye throughout the entirety of its life. Um, and the red buckeye is native to North America. It's not native to Ohio. It's native just a bit south of us and down even into the Quite a bit further south than we are. Matt Guthrie um, did point out that that hybrid usually comes true to seed, Asculus uh, uh, crossed with Carnia. 
Hmm. So I'm not familiar with those crosses at all. Um, yeah, I'm not either. Jim and I are both classically trained foresters and ecologists. So when it comes to the horticultural varieties and, and the grafting and stuff that takes place, that's not our strength. But um, we might have somebody on here that could help us too. I should have promoted Denise up. She might be able to help us as well. She's more of a horticulturalist. Um, one more question in the chat before we move to the question and answers are, is, are there any special challenges when attempting to ID very old trees? Um, so when, when I've um, worked in some, a few old growth forests around either in central Ohio or up in Michigan, the bark, one of the things that struck me is the bark on those really old trees will look a fair amount different. So there's some similarities between them, but they will look a fair amount different than you know, less old trees. So if you're dealing with trees that are two, 300, maybe 400 plus years old, the bark on those trees will look a lot different than the bark of a 100 to 150 year old tree. Yeah. And my, the most common one that I've seen where that can really throw you for a loop is yellow poplar tulip tree. If you get big, massive old ones, that bark starts to look a lot different. But again, you always want to look in the winter, it's kind of fun, especially when you're teaching a class and you watch all the students struggling. But the key is just to look for the clues and kind of try to piece it together. What do you find under the tree if the bark's not obvious? You can just, you got to start digging around looking for what are the predominant leaves. So there are different ways to, to ferret it out. And then where you're located and all that comes into play. But bark can be tough on those very tall old trees because you can't get the twigs and see the other stuff too. Well, that actually segues us into our first question on the question and answer. By looking at Bart, can you tell the age of a tree? So it takes a, what I will say is it takes a lot of time and experience to be able to give a really rough estimate for the age of the tree. Um, so generally speaking, no, and even tree size is really a poor indicator. So if we're looking at the, the diameter of the, the base of the tree, even that is a really poor uh, determination for the age of the tree. Uh, the one tree that is very easy to age um, is white pine because white pine will produce a whirl of branches each and every year. So if you count the number of whirls as you go up that tree, you can age that tree. Um, but uh, to give you an example, up at the Ohio State Fair um, over in the natural resources area, they have a couple fairly large oak logs that are laying up there. And one of the oak logs, if memory serves correctly, is maybe like three and a half, four foot in diameter. So pretty large. And then they have one laying next to it that's probably closer to five uh, foot in diameter. And, you know, the natural assumption is that larger one is going to be um, much older when, in fact, um, it ends up being younger than the one that's smaller than it. And it's based on um, the where it was growing and really the resources that it had available to it. Um, most of the time, uh, the amount of sunlight that it was receiving. Yeah, it's not uncommon to be in a, an oak woods and see white oak, for instance, where the canopy dominant trees are very large. And you'll see some smaller trees, maybe eight or 10 inches in diameter. And, and when we do an increment bore, we find out they're the same age. The ones in the canopy just got more light and had a competitive advantage. So a lot of people are pretty quick to throw out ages and estimates of trees. And there are even some guides out there. And those work maybe on average when you correlate diameter to, to age. But um, there's a lot of variables there. I mean, we know if a tree's four feet in diameter, it's old. But putting it down to within a, even 100 years sometimes is tough. Because I've seen open grown trees grow an inch in diameter a year pretty consistently. So it doesn't take a silver maple long to get 40 inches in diameter. It might be younger than I am. Probably is younger than I am. So good questions. Next question. What is the difference between term terminal bud and end bud? Pretty much the same thing. Just the same different terminology for the same thing. It's the, the bud on the end of the twig. Uh, the, a true terminal bud typically is different in shape. An end bud may just be the one that ends up on the end, I guess is another way to put it. I don't know, Jim, anything else to add? Jim, I think you might be muted. Oh, he's thinking. 
Oh, I don't okay. know if he hears this anymore. Oh, I didn't hear whether was there another question in there. No, I was just but, asking if you had anything to add to terminal oh. bud versus. Um, no, so you can end have bud. like the suedo terminal bud, which is an end bud, but it's not. It's at the end, but it's not truly, you know, right. the very apex of the of the twig. Yeah. So usually, if it's a pseudo terminal bud, you'll see a little bit of twig that kind of just withered and and died back to that bud. Where a true terminal bud will have a, a distinctly different, usually larger bud that sometimes looks different, but they're both in buds. So kind of gets hard to explain that. Patrick Other asks, questions? can you safely estimate a leaf size by looking at its mark on a tree? Oh, by the leaf scar on the tree, the size of the leaf? I believe that's what they're asking, yes. I'd say there's a correlation between it but I don't know how safely. I mean, some trees have a swollen base to the, the leaf, so it may make it look bigger than not, but I'd say there's somewhat of a correlation. Really small leaf scars are probably gonna be correlated with really small leaves. Yeah, I mean, you can see, you know, within a species. So if you look at Alanthus or Tree of Heaven, um, the leaf scars are gonna be probably pretty similar size, but you can have some leaves that are, you know, a foot, long foot and half long and then you can have some that are pushing five foot long um, so both of those have very large i mean it they would have large leaf scars but you know you're not going to be able to tell exactly how how long that leaf or how wide that leaf would be um and then uh jim to go along with the key that you're doing sandy said she didn't understand the tall and round buds she would have said just the opposite for each of them okay um Perhaps that's why I got the one wrong, um, but then it worked on the other one. Um, so I think- uh, Actually, didn't mocker. you have to change them both? No, I think the mocker nut hickory worked. Okay. It was um, tall and uh, pointed. Yeah, we'll have to dig into that key. Honestly, neither of us use that key much, but we just kind of at last minute addition. But I, you know, what I would look at is if the width not so much the size of it, but the relationship between the width and the length. And with red maple, that one was just confusing because the actual bud on red maple looked pretty long, but normally they're pretty rounded. So the image wasn't the best image to depict that. But in general, I think if it's considerably longer than it is wide, I would put it in the sharp, tall pointed. If it's about the same width or as it is tall, I'd put it in the more rounded category and it's not going to be perfect there's going to be some gray in there it's not going to work every time and then the last thing we have um meg just says she would love to see the videos uh that you've talked about okay i can and share a few of those when we wrap up here she and can i can stay, stay on, on. Okay. So. any other questions before we wrap up um Danielle, go ahead and if you don't mind, I've got so many windows open, I can't even see my chat. Um, but if you would go ahead and put the uh, Southeast Ohio Woods webpage in the chat. Um, I can do it now, I found it. I'll get okay. you. Yeah, maybe. If you tell me, because I always get that one in the tree ID mixed up. So it's well, if you go to this site, yeah. there'll be a tab that gets you to the tree ID. So this will get you to everything. And then the tree ID one, if you want to go strictly to the tree ID videos, you go this way. So either one of those will get you to the sites. Um, the tree ID videos right now, we have about 30 um, videos, they're three to five minutes in length, and they'll feature a tree and walk through the details of that tree. So I highly recommend you jump on there and just watch some of those. I think I th hopefully they're informative for you. Um, the latest one we launched Tuesday was American Chestnut. Um, so there's, I'll try to get some really close ups of, of twigs and buds and all the features that are available when I make those videos. So by all means, check those out. Those are all YouTube videos, I'll launch them on Facebook, we put them on YouTube, and then you can go to the site to find them all. And if you need closed captioning, you can get that through YouTube at those sites. And also, I will do a follow up when we get these videos and things posted, 
I will, I have emails for everybody that logged on and registered for this meeting. So I'll send you a link and I'll do a post with all the resources from today, including the PowerPoints and the videos and some web links that I'll put out there. It'll be probably about a week before those all come up, but I'll send you a reminder to go look there. And again, that's at the u.osu.edu site. Any other questions? If not, folks have a great day. Um, really enjoyed um, presentation and working with you. And I will share just a few more of those videos if anybody wants to stick around, but by all means, don't feel like you need to. So um, let's do, here's, here's one that you might be interested in. Looked at this yesterday. You can see this really strange looking bark and that's pretty far away on a small tree. I tried to put my hat in every one of these pictures to give you an idea. But let's look at this tree very close up. Real spongy looking bark. Um, and I wish I could pause those. I don't know why it won't let me pause them. But there's that close up looking bark. It's very spongy. It's almost like styrofoam and you got layers of white and brown. That's, that's an American elm bark. And they don't always look quite that pronounced but sometimes they do. Are you guys seeing that? Yeah, I'm, everything I'm is still showing up on yes. my screen pretty okay. well. Uh, Americans. Most of these are from Lake Catherine State Nature Preserve. I went out yesterday and just went crazy taking videos and tried to make them short and sweet. But that's one, if you look up at the crown of the tree and you see bright white, that's a pretty good indicator of American sycamore. And again, we'll find a way to get these out there. That's a little close up of the American sycamore bark. And I apologize. When I zoom in, I cannot stay still on those pictures. So too much um, caffeine. Well, that and the magnification hurts you. This one, lighting was tough. You know, you're in the woods, sometimes the lighting can be really tough, but a real dark colored bark. And I, this one's on my property line, so I had a hard time. If but you're if ever you, looking at something and you're trying to figure out whether it is black walnut or not, if you take a, just a pocket knife and carve on the bark just a little bit, you'll get a really nice chocolatey brown color. You can actually see a little bit of that chocolatey brownness um, kind of in the center of part of that screen. Yeah, I'm going to zoom into some of it right there. But right on these little, if you just with your finger break off a little bit, it'll be a nice chocolate brown color. There's some of it down there now. So that's black walnut. And let's just do maybe one more and then we'll make these available. So this is one that's kind of surprising when you look higher up, you, you get almost shaggy bark. And some people will confuse this tree with a shag bark hickory. But if you look up here, you'll get these plates of bark that are like the size of a dollar bill or larger, but down here it's more blocky. And that's a, that's a, a distant shot of a white oak. There's the white oak again, a different tree. But as you get higher up, you get bigger plates. In fact, the big white oak on my property, the plates are big enough that bats will actually spend time there in the summer up under the bark. So I have about 16 to 20 different species of these little shots. So we'll share those with folks. And uh, here's the one that caught me off guard, Jim. Lake Catherine. Ooh massive sweet gum trees down there and i was like yellow poplar no maybe but i don't know how tall those trees are they're well over 100 feet tall and when you look when we get down to the base of my hat and i don't have a small head there's my hat right there so they're big massive trees it's a swampy wet area and you find the sweet gum balls and the decomposing leaves all over but yeah i was shocked and i'd seen those before but i'd kind of forgotten about them but that's a close up of that bark. So if you're ever down our way in Jackson County, I highly recommend Lake Catherine. Um, so with that, let's see, we've got about 60 people on. I think it's probably time to sign off. Um, we're running up almost two hours. So appreciate everybody joining us. Um, this will end our Day in the Woods series for 2020. Hopefully next year, some of those sessions will be live. 
but I think we've learned a lot about presenting virtually. So hopefully we can do some of these virtual ones for those of you that can't get to Southern Ohio to join us in the future. So thanks, have a great day and take part of your day to enjoy it out in the woods today. It's gonna to be a beautiful day. Thanks everyone. Thanks Jim for helping and Danny. Thank you. And Julie, who's not on any longer, but appreciate all the help. So at one time we had 129 on, I, I think. I saw as high as a 143. 143, good. It's a nice turnout. And folks, a lot of them hung on. We still got a few closing out now. So yeah. hopefully Sweet it Sweet gum well. was pretty impressive there. It's that that's in the uh the long i think it's called the salt lake creek trail they got some nice boardwalks down there um there's tons of uh umbrella magnolia sprouts all over with stems that big um it's it's impressive down there it's i really need to cool. have stephanie take me down there and give me a little tour because she's, oh, she's anytime kinds of different uh there is a pitch pine weird stuff down there i don't know if i got that pitch pine picture here. i don't yeah, think i've I don't know that I've really ever seen umbrella. Look at this holiday. thing in the floodplain. Big old pitch pine. What is that? A pitch pine. It's massive. Okay. Nice. I'm assuming mm. that I didn't see the name on it. Was it pitch pine or was it short leaf? I'm 99.9% .9 sure pitch pine. Um, That's cool. Um, it's got to be close to a state record. Because I remember at one time the pitch pine record was in Hawking County, right around, right along State Route 93, like Islesboro or in that area. And oh, those trees I weren't near, I, they weren't near as big as this tree. No, oh, I think I know it just like right off the road on most. right on the road on the would be on the west side of the road if you're heading south on your right. And yeah. they were down in a little, there's like a driveway and there's a couple, yep. but they're no longer there, I don't think. There was one or two large ones there. Hmm, I don't know. I guess I haven't paid attention to, I've driven out that way for a while, but I, I think I know the tree you're talking about. Yeah, come down sometime. We'll take a hike. I'll, I'll give you the tour of Lake Catherine, the trails anyway. And and uh, and then when we're doing the hemlock work off trail, there's some phenomenal areas too. So get you to help do some hemlock work sometime and, yep. and get off trail. But All right. Thanks for your help. I think it went pretty well yep appreciate it. it i wish i would have walked through red maple first <laughs> it didn't help that you couldn't look at it at home but that bud the, the bad thing the bud they give you in the picture is longer than it is wide yeah i and i you know i didn't even stop to think about you know typically you know most red maple buds are just about short. round aren't they yeah, yeah. I mean, they're short and round um yeah oh well i got to the marker right hickory right so. I was hoping to do the scope a little bit, but when I turn that on, sometimes it becomes my screen and it just messes with it. And I think it's, it's hard for me to focus live and stuff. So I think it, I think it went pretty well. Appreciate it. Have okay. a good weekend. Yep. We'll talk to you later. Thanks. Can we count this two hours advanced ed for master gardeners? I can't answer that question. Um, if Denise is still on, um, but if you want to email me, I'll put my email in the chat and uh, I would be glad to do some follow-up work or verify that you were on and I don't know why it wouldn't count. Thanks everybody.